Dean of Libraries here at the uh, University of Tennessee. And it's a great pleasure to have you all here tonight, and it's a great honor for us to celebrate Charlie Daniel and commemorate his great gift to this library of 20,000 editorial cartoons. Um, I thought of that. I thought of that as his life's work, but he's still producing. So we might have 20,000 more before we're finished. We'll look forward to that. Well, we here in Knoxville are so lucky to have um, Charlie Daniel to help us start every day with comic relief, insightful wit, and intelligent commentary. Uh, Mr. Daniel has been the editorial cartoonist at the Knoxville News Sentinel since 1992. He began his career here in 1958 with the Knoxville Journal. And again, I'd like to welcome him as well as um, his wife Patsy and other members of the Daniel family. Thank you all for being here. Yes. Well, as I mentioned, we're here to celebrate Charlie Daniel and to commemorate his great gift of his personal archive to the UT Libraries. His drawings are living artifacts of our time. Here in the UT Libraries, they will be preserved and made available for study by generations of scholars and students. The collection takes its place among many other national and internationally renowned collection and can be studied in context with related materials such as our university archives and our modern political archives. Um, I always say that one of the most interesting and fun things about the job of a librarian or an archivist is collecting these great collections, but then also seeing how people come to use them. And you can never predict um, what students and scholars and others will would do with these collections. Of course, they'll write um, scholarly books and uh, articles, but it's, it, the collections like this play a vital role in the education of our students. And more and more these days, we're looking for opportunities not just to educate students in the classroom, but to give them exposure to primary research material. So these are the the raw materials of research that we're celebrating tonight. Our special collections staff, with Charlie's support and guidance, has worked dilig diligently to describe and organize these 20,000 drawings according to the social and political issues they elucidate. To share these wonderful drawings with as many people as possible, we've also created an online exhibit which features a th more than 1,000 of these cartoons. And so they're available. Um, here to be studied, uh, to come on site, to see them in an exhibit, but people from around the world can now access these collections too and see um, Mr. Daniel's wonderful work. And you can view uh, material from the website on the monitors that we've set up upside. We also have, have the cartoons displayed throughout this floor. And if you haven't had a chance, I invite you to, to linger after the remarks and, and, and appreciate them. I'd like to personally thank Charlie also for one of the highest honors of my career. Um, he provided a cartoon of me featured in our annual library development review. Uh, when my wife saw it, she said, wow, that is meaningful on so many different levels. <laughs> I haven't had the courage to talk her through that and get her interpretation, but one day I will. So thank you for that great honor, for the great honor of donating your materials to, to, this, to this wonderful library. Um, now I'd like to welcome the Knoxville News Sentinel Managing Editor, Tom Chester, for a few words. Tom uh, directs multimedia content for the News Sentinel, Knoxville, uh, knoxnews.com, and all their other publishing platforms. He joined the News Sentinel in 1987 and has held a variety of roles there as staff writer and editor. Tom is a University of Tennessee communications graduate and also a University Air Force veteran. So we welcome you, Tom. It's, uh, it's a privilege for me to be here tonight. Uh, I've known Charlie, uh, when I first met Charlie in 1976, um, we both had brown hair and brown mustaches. Look at us now. And so, so lots of things have changed in that time, and many things haven't changed. And um, when, when I first walked into the newsroom of the old Knoxville Journal, it was downtown. And um, I, I was a copy boy. 
a lowly copy boy, and he's already a star cartoonist. Uh, today I'm a lowly managing editor, and he's a superstar cartoonist. So <laughs> some things don't change. So that's so when I first walked into the newsroom, I, I saw um, Charlie, and and he had a sweater, and and as I say, he had brown hair and a mustache. He had his coffee cup and his pipe. And uh, we both we both smoked pops, the old uh, Briar Briarwood pops. Dr. Grable, I believe, was the brand that we used and the cheapest tobacco we could find. The coffee was decent. It was JFG, thank goodness. And so one of my one of my jobs as the uh, as the uh, managing editor, I still make the coffee today. Charlie doesn't. Uh, one of my jobs as a lowly copy editor was to make the coffee. My cue to make the coffee was when I would see Charlie standing in the doorway of the coffee room cup dangling from one finger, pop in the other, looking. That was my cue. Get up from your desk, run to the coffee room. <clears throat> Charlie never said a word. He didn't have to. He just stood there, cup dangling from one finger, pop in his other hand. I'd go into the coffee room, make the coffee, turn around, and Charlie was gone. And I thought, I just made this coffee. Where is Charlie? I look around, Charlie's in my chair. And I'm thinking, uh, should I ask him to get out of my chair? Well, you know, being a lowly copy boy and he being a star cartoonist, I didn't ask him to get out of my chair. When the coffee began to make and you could smell that, everyone here or, or most folks here probably smell that JFG just percolating in the morning, in the mid-morning, in the afternoon, in the evening. You smell it and so Charlie would get out of my chair. So I could re resume my work, Charlie would get his coffee replenished and he would go sit in someone else's chair. <laughs> so a as you can see, uh, being a star cartoonist, you can sit where you wish, you can do what you wish. Excuse me. Um, I've got three to five minutes to try to summarize 36 years that I've known my good friend Charles Rufus Daniel. It's, it's impossible to do. Um, Charles, Charlie's son and I, Charlie used to bring his son up to the newsroom and we'd talk music for hours and Charlie would come get him and take him home. I'm, I'm glad he never told his dad everything we talked about. But, uh, but with Charlie, um, it's, Charlie followed me to the New Sentinel, I guess, was, uh, was one, one highlight of my career. I left the uh, journal in 1987 and went to the New Sentinel. Five years later, he followed me. I, li I like to think that way. Charlie's, uh, I'm like the Clarence Clemens and he's like Bruce Springsteen, uh, you know, or I'm like Keith Richards and he's Mick Jagger, you know, so those are the comparisons that we make over the years. Um, I know we may not look it now, but we're, you know, we're still holding on for our age. And uh, so, but Charlie, the thing, the thing about Charlie is if you think about 20,000 plus cartoons in, in the collection here, Charlie has done thousands more that he's given to Steve, to, to, to me. I have a personal collection at my home. It's not open to the public, thank you. But it, it, is, it is just great. Charlie would hear something that someone said, and the next thing I would know, I'd have this wonderful cartoon. They're on my wall, and when the SDX a few years ago, he did a great cartoon that's on my wall, signed, and, and these things. And, uh, and Charlie has never turned down a cause. His, his work is, is throughout the community. Uh, it's, I struggled with, with what to say about Charlie tonight. I wanted to um, tell him how much I you know, have enjoyed working with him and also I wanted to uh, say some things that I never get to say with Charlie. Charlie will come through, he does, most folks don't know, but Charlie will do three or four cartoons and then there's one that appears in the newspaper. I'm fortunate to have some of those that didn't appear. If you think the ones that are in the paper are really great, you ought to see the ones that aren't, they're great. Charlie would come by the office, and he doesn't, doesn't say a lot to me, other than you know, standing in the doorway of the coffee room. Uh, but he would come by the office, and he'd just hand me a cartoon. I'd look at it, and I'd go, oh, you're going to get emails. You're, they're going to be, Charlie shakes his head and leave. So in a couple of days, I'd come into the office, and there'd be three or four emails lying on my desk. And, and then Charlie gets voluminous emails, and then Charlie brings me the good emails. These are the ones that begin. Daniel, you moron. <laughs> Daniel, you're so sophomoric. Daniel, Rosie's diner. These are the good ones. These are the, these are the great compliments that, that Charlie shares with me. Uh, the really good cartoons, uh, I, I get to see them of a the morning. Charlie comes in, I come in about six. Charlie comes in around seven or so, and. 
And so there are a couple of other guys who come in, and we all race to open the paper. After 36 years, I still race to open the paper each morning, see what it is, even if I've seen it the day before, just in case he changed it. And, uh, and so we all, we'll all get up, and I'll go back by Charlie's office. He goes down a hallway, and he's on my left. And I'll go, you're a very sick man, Charlie. <laughs> so then I, then I go back to work. Charlie never says a word. In a couple of days, he'll do another commentary on, on and I'm thinking, oh, God. You're a little sick man, Charlie. <laughs> and then, I swear, by the end of the week, I've got to go back there again. You truly are a sick man, Charlie. <laughs> Charlie never says a word. These, these are the points, and I say this with love and affection and admiration, because Charlie Daniel has passion for what he does. As an editorial cartoonist, the political and social commentary that he presents is, is unbelievable. He loves this community. He loves the people that's in it. The things that he says and he does, they are meant to evoke some sort of emotion response from us, be it anger, be it joy, be it tears, be it laughter, or when you laugh to tears, which is often the case that happens in, in our office. Uh, it may not be the case when some people call, uh, to the office, but you know what's interesting? You know, I get the phone calls. I, I handle complaints. Uh, Charlie Daniel, he's a Democrat. Well, Charlie Daniel, he's a Republican. Can you guys get you know? And I'm going. He's doing a great job because you know he's got them all mad. And uh, and and most of you are. If you're not familiar with work, spend the time. Look through the 20,000 cartoons that he has done. I, I, there's just, I, I don't know what to say about his passion, his courage to speak his mind. What he says and does is meant to to make us think to make us act, to make us do, to make us ashamed at times, as well we should be, to make us proud to be in this community, to make us want to evoke change. That's what he does each and every day. Um, I went back to Charlie's office today in closing, and uh, Charlie wasn't there, so I got to sit in Charlie's chair. <laughs> uh, I told him that we should probably, like, I could probably sign up 15 or 20 people tonight, 10 bucks a head, just to go sit in Charlie's chair. It's a, the chair's a wreck. It's, it's, it's just a, it's a wreck. It really is. But I, but I set before his board, his, uh, his light board. I, I don't know what the proper words are for the tools that he has and his markers, his pencils, his rulers, the, the scribblings that he has on the wall, the, the papers he surrounds himself with, the, the reading material, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times. And, and I sat there and I, and, and I thought, wow, this is, this is where the magic happens. Every single day, this is where the magic happens. And I would like to say that I got up and, and I would just had, wow. But unlike Charlie, my mind was blank. I don't have this insight, this, this thought process that he has that he can say with a cartoon and three or four words that it would take me a thousand words to say and I'm not sure you'd understand it. He does. That's my friend. Charles Rufus Daniel. Wow, well, let's go home. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. My friend Tom is a uh, real newspaper man. I'm not. Uh, Harry Hirschfield, who's a uh, cartoonist and a humorist, which I hope is redundant, uh, asked his uh, editor if, in fact, a cartoonist was a newspaper man. And the editor replied, uh, is a barnacle a ship? <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> Tom is a real newspaper man. And, uh, in journalism school, they, they teach you the four R's, uh, who, what, where, when. And in, in cartooning school, they teach you the two W's. Yeah, that's what it is. Four W's, two W's. In cartooning school, they teach you the two W's, Westerly Rabbit. So uh, <laughs> I want to uh, recognize Patsy and my son Charles, who came all the way from St. Louis, Missouri today with his son Chip, whose real name is Charles, and you think we're original. <laughs> <laughs> My daughter Sarah. Sarah 
has moved all over the country, but uh, she's now moved back to Knoxville to Broadacres, seven tenths of a mile from us, and uh, which makes her mama and I uh, quite happy. Uh, that is uh, my bio reads, uh, I married my childhood sweetheart. Patsy's uh, bio reads, she married her high school sweetheart. <laughs> We're both talking about the same people. Uh, it's just a different view of history. Uh, in the second grade, I went to Patsy's house and took her a box of Valentine's candy. Uh, she added it to the stack of Valentine's candy she had gotten that day, and she finally uh, got around to me uh, when we were juniors in high school. So, uh, which is why the uh, Bowes read childhood sweetheart, high school sweetheart. So, uh, several years ago, I was at a Christmas party uh, at Nathan and Mary Ford's house in Parrotsville in Cock County. And uh, I met Barbara Dooley there, and she was the dean of the library then. And she approached me about giving my collection to the library. Now, Betsy Creedmoor Jr. had been after me for years, you know, said you ought to give you tee your cartoons, and I'd say, oh, shucks, blush, and all that. But uh, Barbara really said, well, let's get together and have lunch and, and talk about it. And so, uh, so we did, and, and she persuaded me that uh, I should do this. And so I agreed. And then Barbara would call and say, can we come get the cartoons? And I would procrastinate and say, no, not right now. And she would call and say, can we come get the cartoons? And I'd say, wait a while. And so Barbara moved on. <laughs> and uh, Jennifer, Jennifer Bills took over the uh, hard task of uh, prying the cartoons away from me. Uh, but Jennifer did it right. She skipped me and went straight to Patsy. <laughs> and Patsy wanted to get those things out of the garage. And so uh, they came and got them. Well, the first time they were going to, they called and said, we're coming to get them. And I said, no, no, wait, wait. So we put it off a week, and then uh, they came and got them. And I, I don't know why I was holding on to them. I wish I'd given them up way back when Betsy first suggested it. But uh, I, uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Steve Smith and the library and Jennifer Bills for, for prying those away from me and uh, uh, Alicia and Elizabeth Wilson and Justin who did all the heavy lifting and uh, er Erwin and Seth and Richard who uh, uh, digitized them. Is that how you say it? Digitized them? Because you can go on the uh, internet now and, and see them all, so uh, I'm, I'm really grateful. And Pat and I last night spent about two hours uh, on their website looking at these uh, cartoons, and uh, uh, the, that was a lot of cartoons, the, uh, uh, <laughs> the good, the bad, and the ugly, because uh, some of the early ones, you know, uh, I wasn't too sure about. Uh, in clinical counseling, there's a process known as uh, uh, paradoxical therapy. It's a way in which the uh, counselor will, will exaggerate uh, a situation to the point of being ridiculous, such, uh, thus making the uh, counselee laugh at his or herself, which I, I think is what uh, we as cartoonists are. Uh, trying to do. Uh, J. Ding Darling uh, said, the editorial cartoon is that humor-coded capsule by means of which the uh, sound sober judgment of editorial minds are surreptitiously gotten down the throats of an apathetic public. Uh, <laughs> I love that one. Uh, 
Edwin A. Roberts, Jr., on the other hand, wrote, uh, the editorial cartoon is the most uh, useless and anti-intellectual feature in modern journalism. A political cartoon is nothing more than a wisecrack producing a complex problem into a one-liner. The, the best uh, editorial cartoons, that is, those that stir the blood, if not the mind, uh, exercises in de demagoguery. All editorial cartoonists should go back to drawing department store ads. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Roberts, Jr. was an editorial writer. Uh, the best definition of an editorial writer is one that hides in the bushes during the battle, and when the battle is over, comes out and shoots the wounded. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, an editorial writer is really nothing more than uh, an editorial cartoonist who can't draw. Um, <laughs> And an editorial cartoonist is nothing more than an editorial writer who can't spell. So, uh, <laughs> the big difference is the difference between uh, Leroy Page and, and Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Samuel Taylor Coleridge uh, wrote in his, his epic poem, like one that on, that's on a lonesome road, doth walk in fear and dread, and having once turned round, walks on and turns no more his head because he knows a frightful fiend doth close behind him, him tread. Uh, about a hundred years later, Leroy Page said the same thing when he said, never look back, something may be ga gaining on you. So, uh, <laughs> editorial writers uh, write it like uh, uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge very eloquently, and cartoonists do it like uh, Leroy Page where you get a laugh out of it. And, you remember it. So uh, then there's my definition, uh, which goes the editorial cartoonist, through his uh, keen wit and artistic ability, makes uh, profound and thought-provoking statements on matters political and social confronting his community, state, nation, and world. Big deal. Uh, <laughs> My, uh, my barber, back growing up in Weldon, did the same thing while giving me a haircut. Uh, <laughs> Weldon barbers were the, were the uh, talk radio people of the 30s and 40s. Uh, they had all the answers. They could, they could expound on, on politics and sports and theology and, and philosophy and history and you name it. Uh, they had the answer. Uh, Charles Schultz's uh, father was a barber. Charles Schultz, you know, was the creator of Peanuts. No, God created Peanuts. Uh, here's a poem I wrote. God made the trees and the bees and the birds and the flowers. I could go on for hours. God made lots of stuff. God made man. Man made snuff. Now, the point of that, of course, is too often we give God credit for things that are man-made. Uh, uh, Floyd the barber was expounding on love, and, and Andy Taylor said, uh, Floyd, what do you know about love? And Floyd very emphatically said, I've been a barber for 30 years. And that was answer enough. Uh, I got most of my theology from uh, old Bob Hope movies, uh, the road shows. Uh, I think it was the road to utopia, and and uh, Dorothy Lamour was in her salon, and 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 Bob Hope was giving her the once over, and Dorothy Lamour said, "Fate has thrown us together," and Bob Hope says, uh, "You weren't thrown together, baby. That took <laughs> that took planning." So. Uh, Charles Schultz wrote, uh, if you don't say anything in a cartoon, you might as well not draw it. Uh, humor which does not say anything is worthless humor. I contend cartoonists should be given their chance to preach. So I just took my chance and did my preaching. So we'll move on. I have, I have a Peanuts cartoon hanging up next to my you probably saw it, next to my light board. And, and Lucy's on her hands and knees with the crayon, and she tells Charlie Brown, uh, 
I decided to go into political cartooning. And Charlie, I, and she said, I'm going to ridicule everything. And Charlie Brown says, uh, I understand, Lucy. By the use of ridicule, you hope to point out our faults in government and thus improve our way of life. And Lucy said, no, I just want to ridicule everything. <laughs> I confess that we as cartoonists uh, do do a lot of ridiculing. Uh, cartooning basically is a negative form of art. We, we rarely say anything nice about anyone. We mostly uh, ridicule. Uh, Mark Russell, the uh, piano playing humorist, uh, referred to a cartoon as instant freeze frame ridicule. Uh, we do like to uh, ridicule. I also admit that uh, editorial cartooning is an unfair form of art. We, we stretch both face and fact. We, we misquote, we twist quotes, we make up outrageous quotes and insert them into balloons over politicians' heads. Uh, we, we, we lie. <laughs> but we do these things. Uh, to reveal the truth. So, so to uh, paraphrase what Horace Greeley said about the press, uh, I say, then hail to the cartoonist, uh, chosen guardian of freedom, strong sword arm of justice, uh, bright sunbeam of truth. I was a sophomore in high school, and the pretty lady uh, looked up from the match cover and subductively said, draw me. And I drew her, and I mailed her off to the art school in Minneapolis, Minnesota. A couple of weeks later, I come home from school, and there in my living room is a fella from the art school in Minneapolis, Minnesota, telling my mother that her son had great promise. And I proved it because on that day when my mother said, do you promise that you'll work diligently if I buy this car correspondence course? And I promised. <laughs> and I waited anxiously you know, for it to arrive. And then the day it came, it, it came with a drawing board, which I still have, by the way, and a, a set of uh, uh, number two pencils, uh, a big fat eraser, and lesson number one, which consisted of uh, drawing rectangles, triangles, and squares. Rectangles, triangles, and squares. Oh my, rectangles and triangles and squares. I never finished lesson one, <laughs> never. My mother never let me forget that. At 105, she would remind me, when are you going to finish lesson one? <laughs> Had I finished lesson one and mailed it off to the art school in Minneapolis, Minnesota, it probably would have been graded by Charles Schultz. He had just gotten out of the Army. He went to work for the art school in Minneapolis, Minnesota, while he was working on this comic strip he entitled uh, Little People. And uh, somebody at the syndicate switched names and put peanuts up there. But uh, had, I, had I finished lesson one, uh, Charles Schultz would have discovered me, no doubt, and asked me to come help him with drawing little people. But, uh, that's gone. So uh, after I'd been at the journal for, I don't know, 10 years or so, uh, my mother was visiting us, and she was looking at my work, and she said, uh, son, your, your work almost looks professional. <laughs> Patsy complains that my head is uh, so full of song lyrics, uh, uh, sports trivia, uh, lines from cartoons and Looney Tunes, and there's no room for uh, going to the store. Remember, go to the store and buy some milk. Patsy, did you remember to stop at Weigel's and pick up the milk? Me, no, but I remember Diana Washington singing, and when my life is through, and the angels asked me to recall the thrill of them all, I'll tell them I remember you. Well, that obviously didn't go over, and so uh, 
I went back to Wagles and I got, I got the mail. But uh, I do finally remember uh, the editors uh, in my life. That was uh, uh, Louis Carrar and Ed Yoder, who were the editors at the Daily Tar Heel, who, who told me that, okay, we'll run your cartoons and we'll pay you 50 cents a cartoon. And so I said, great. And then the next year, Fred Paulidge was the editor of the Daily Tar Heel, and we had the same deal. I, I, I tried to work them up to 75 cents, but uh, no way. And then there was Roland Geddes, who ran my stuff in the, uh, the bi-weekly Chapel Hill Newsreel. And it was uh, Raymond Geddes, we called him Fu. And Fu and I made up this, this uh, 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 resume of my stuff. And we, we sent it out to uh, 40 newspapers all over the South. Uh, we wanted to uh, keep it in the South so I wouldn't have to learn a new language. So uh, out of the 40 newspapers, I got one positive reply. And that was from Guy L. Smith of the Knoxville Journal, who I will forever be grateful because, because he gave me an opportunity when 39 other papers said, nah, forget it. So, uh, and then there was Steve Humphreys, who, who, after Mr. Smith died, Steve was the editor for a short while. And it was Steve who, who talked me out of putting the, the captions in print above the cartoon and start using balloons in the cartoon because I was getting so wordy. They, it was getting to be three and four lines of type above the cartoon. And he said, well, why don't you just write it in there? So, uh, so I started doing that. And then Bill Childress came along, and he was editor. And it was uh, Bill Childress who, who turned me from vertical to horizontal, uh, speaking about the way the, the cartoon went <laughs> in the paper. Uh, and it was also Bill Childress who, who got me started into public speaking. Uh, he came to me one day and said, uh, I want you to speak to my Optimist Club. And I said, uh, I, don't, I don't do that. Uh, cartoonists should be seen and not heard. And he said, you didn't understand. I want you to speak to my Optimist Club. So from then on, I started doing the public speaking bit. Uh, then Ron McMahon came. And he turned me over to Barry Henderson, because Ron couldn't handle me. And so, uh, and Barry Henderson and I, he was a great pipe smoker. And he and I were sitting in that back room and puff away on our pipes. And when they banned smoking in, in, in the building, I thought that was the end of my career, because I thought it, it was all connected, pipe dreams and smoke and ideas. But that wasn't so. so uh, and then in, in December of uh, 1991, when the journal sank, uh, Harry Moskos came and, and fished me out of the drink and brought me downstairs and turned me over to Hort Kennedy. Uh, and Hort was the editorial page editor, and he and I worked great together for many years. And then Jack McElroy came, and Jack is the one who got Rosie into the paper. Uh, in, in 2007, he came to me and said, we need something at the top of the editor, at the perspective page, and, and could you come up with something? And the light bulb went off, which is the way cartoonists work. We wait for the light bulb. And the light bulb went off, and uh, we put Rosie up there. And uh, so I'll never forget any of these guys. It takes a village of editors to get cartoons on the editorial page. Uh, I'll close with a few of my favorite letters and emails. Here's one from December 2nd, 1958. Dear Charles, I appreciate your cartoon. And the August 29th, now I don't know why it took from August to December for him to appreciate this cartoon. <laughs> but I appreciate your cartoon in the August 29th edition of the Knoxville Journal, but you must not have seen me in the way of beauty for some time, so I'm sending you a picture. My kindest regards, sincerely, Esther Skifarver. <laughs> he sent me his picture, and I've got it hanging up in my den there along with the letter. 
Okay, here's another one. November the 3rd, 1959. Dear Charles, thanks for sending the original of your cartoon on the baseball hearings. I will have it framed and hang it in my office. I believe there's a little improvement in my portrait with kind regards, Essus. <laughs> we got on a first name basis in, in less than a year. Uh, <laughs> December 21st, 1966, uh, dear Mr. Daniel, uh, Mr. Wallace Etzel, President, special agent in charge of our Knoxville office, has forwarded me your excellent cartoon, which appeared in the Knoxville Journal. It was a pleasure to receive it, and I do not want to miss the opportunity without thanking you for autographing it to me. Sincerely, J. Edgar Hoover. <laughs> and to balance things out, uh, dear Mr. Daniel, I have noted with interest your cartoons, You Tell Them, Bud, which appeared in the March 26th issue of the Knoxville Journal. I would appreciate receiving an original of the cartoon if it's agreeable for you so that I might add it to my personal collection. Sincerely, James A. Hoffa. <laughs> yeah. Okay, here's some, some updated email. Uh, this one was sent to Jack McElroy. Uh, your cartoonist guy, Daniel, should put a heading above his cartoon saying he's a raging liberal. If Obama wins the election in four weeks, the only people getting carved up will be the children in our country due to the out of control spending. Uh, this was about the cartoon I did of Big Bird like a turkey with, with big bird's legs sitting up in the air. And so, uh, then I get this one. Have you ever drawn a cartoon that was favorable to Obama? Question mark. So, those two balance out. So, uh. Dear Daniel C., with marginal art skills. Well, we'll stop there on that. <laughs> this is another one to the editor. Uh, this was after I did, they, they were voting on guns in, in uh, parks, and I did uh, uh, Gun Smokey, and I had Smokey the Bear with packing. He was, getting, he was getting ready to draw, so. Editor, okay, okay, all right already, we get it. Your cartoonist is anti-gun. We might remind the gentleman that unlike political cartoonists, guns can actually perform a useful function. <laughs> we turned that one over to the FBI. So, uh. Daniel, I wonder almost on a day-to-day -day basis how you got to be the central cartoonist. Your cartoons are drawn like that of a high schooler, which by the way is a promotion from the guy who wrote me and said uh, his eight-year-old granddaughter could draw better with crayons. So, uh, like that of a high schooler, your cartoon wit borders on zero. Uh, Rosie's Diner is tired and old school. I did a cartoon of, of it showed a church and it was a uh, Pleasant Valley Methodist, United Methodist Church. And out of the church was this balloon, and it was saying, uh, Calm down, Miss Quigby. Uh, Meth Free Tennessee is not a Baptist plot to get rid of the Methodists. <laughs> it's the governor's programs against methamphetamines. So I get this, this letter. Daniel, I'm highly offended by your cartoon in today's paper. How stupid do you think Methodists are? <clears throat> stupid enough to buy your paper, but not for long. You owe all United Methodists an apology. The Reverend, sincerely Reverend, whoever. Uh, I wrote him back and, and said, on, in answer to your question on how stupid I think Methodists are, uh, my wife was a Methodist and she married me. So, uh, <laughs> I did this cartoon, I did this cartoon on uh, Christmas Eve on the old journal. That's when I was 
drawing them standing up. And it shows the house with the lights and the, the tree and the window. And Mary and Joseph and the donkey are out here out front. And the guy's out front and he's saying, uh, gee, folks, I'm sorry, but it's Christmas. And the kids are all home and Aunt Pat is here. We just don't have any room. Try the motel in Pixley. And I thought that was a uh, light on, you know, for a uh, Christmas Eve cartoon. And I get this letter uh, dated December 24th. He wrote it on the day it came out, so he was upset. Uh, Mr. Daniel, I thought your cartoon and the December 24th paper was in very poor taste. I don't appreciate it. And I'd like to encourage you to never, under any circumstances, be lighthearted about the Lord Jesus Christ. Sincerely, any signs. Uh, I always thought uh, lighthearted was the opposite of uh, dark-hearted and, and heavy-hearted. So uh, I wrote him back. And, uh, uh, dear Mr. So -so, uh, January the 2nd. Dear Mr. So-and-so, uh, I always thought very poor taste referred to my wife Patsy's cooking, not my cartoon. <laughs> you didn't understand the meaning of the December 24th cartoon, or we're looking at two different cartoons. Sincerely, uh, Charles Daniel. <laughs> then I get this letter. <clears throat> January the 5th. Dear Mr. Daniel, I thought your letter of January the 2nd was in very poor taste. <laughs> I don't appreciate it, and I would like to encourage you to never, under any circumstances, be lighthearted about your wife Patsy's cooking. <laughs> Sincerely, Patsy Daniel. Samuel J. Irwin wrote a book called The Humor of a Country Lawyer. And uh, in the preface, uh, he said, uh, humor is one of God's most marvelous gifts. Humor gives us smiles, laughter, and gaiety. Humor reveals the roses and hides the thorns. Humor makes our heavy burdens light and smooths the rough spots in our pathway. Humor endows us with the capacity to clarify the obscure, to simplify the complex, to deflate the pompous, to point a moral, to adorn a tale. Uh, I believe in humor, and, and that's what I've dedicated my life to. And thank you so much for coming out.